Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to present today's program, Feather Embellishments and Mexican Huipiles, as part of our Curator's Choice series, where we join curators for lively conversations about their passions and projects that inspire audiences to engage with different worldviews and find joy in the multiplicity of the human experience. The huipil, a garment worn by women in Mexico from the time before the arrival of the Europeans to the present day, is a landmark in Mesoamerican attire generally formed of hand-woven cloth panels that are folded and stitched into a rectangular garment. They feature a rich array of materials, colors, techniques, and designs, and constitute one of the essential and dynamic forms of cultural identity. We are honored to be joined today by Elena Phipps, scholar of textile traditions of the Americas, and Hector Meneses Lozano, director of the Museo Textil de Oaxaca. They will begin by briefly tracing the history of the huipil, Meneses Lozano will share some examples from the extensive collection of the Museo Textil de Oaxaca. And then the discussion will focus on a unique group of huipiles woven with spun downy bird feathers. Let me introduce our esteemed guests. Hector M. Meneses Lozano has served as director of the Museo Textil de Oaxaca, Oaxaca, Mexico, since 2012. Previously, he was for four years the museum's head of conservation and collections management. Meneses Lozano has been a board member of the North American Textile Conservation Conference since 2008 and co-organizer of the Encuentro de Textiles Mesoamericanos, hosted in Oaxaca since 2014. Elena Phipps holds a PhD in pre-Columbian art history and archaeology from Columbia University and teaches textile history, techniques, and cultures in the UCLA Department of World Arts and Cultures Dance. During her time as a senior textile conservator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art from 77 to 2010, she co-curated two major exhibitions, the award-winning Colonial Andes, Tapestries and Silverwork from 1430 to 1830 in 2004, and the Interwoven Globe, Worldwide, Worldwide Textile Trade in 2013. Among her publications are Cochineal Red, The Art History of a Color, The Peruvian Four Selvage Cloth, an investigation of a colonial Latin American textile, which details her research on a special Mexican textile composed of spun feathers and rabbit hair. I have a few quick technical bits of housekeeping before we get going. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and then select side by side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's all from me. Over to you, Elena. Hello, and thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And let me just share my screen and I will get started. So um, I love this topic. I think it's a very interesting subject. And I'm very happy to be here uh, with Hector uh, virtually. Uh, I am here sitting in our classroom at, uh, at the Fowler Museum with my students. So excuse me for wearing a mask, but that's the protocols here at UCLA. So what I wanted to do today was uh, give a little bit of a, um, a preview about something to do with the Fowler Museum, which inspired this program, because it also inspired my teaching a class uh, this quarter on the textile traditions of Mexico. I have been teaching for over 10 years here at, at UCLA and usually using collections from the Fowler. And I've never really focused on the amazing collection that is part of the Fowler Museum. Uh, some of the pieces come from really notable collectors, such as the Cordries, the Altman, and the Anawald collections, um, which have found a home here, and they really form the core of our, um, of our class this quarter, and I'd like to present a few of the special pieces here today. 
um, while I was searching for pieces to use in my class, I came across uh, this uh, very unusual uh, Mexican repeal with feathers, um, with spun feathers and um, added feathers. And it was something that reminded me of a project that I had done uh, many years ago in conjunction with my uh, exhibition on a colonial in the colonial world of South America. Um, we know that uh, from colonial documents that women wore these kinds of uh, garments in uh, Mexico, in the region of Mexico, um, before and uh, after the conquest, but also um, uh, textiles which had uh, feathers on them. Uh, when I was um, working on my research for the Colonial Andes exhibition, which focused on the tapestry traditions of South America, I spent a great deal of time trying to look at the relationship between, um, excuse me, I'm getting a notice on my, on my uh, computer. Um, Sorry, excuse me. Um, so I was looking um, at extensive collections of different museums um, that were able to um, uh, uh, show me uh, the colonial textiles around the world. So I traveled extensively to Europe and South America, as well as um, museum collections in the United States. And one of the pieces which I came across um, uh, right next door in New York uh, was this unusual piece that was part that was cataloged as a colonial Peruvian textile. It was something I had never seen before and it had these material qualities and it made me really reconsider what, what, what are the core functions of the material world in the creating of works of art and how uh, different cultures um, build a, a vocabulary that's based in the um, site of origin. This piece did not feel Peruvian to me and I wanted to do some further examinations, which luckily I was able to do um, in conjunction with another, um, with uh, colleagues in the science, the science fields and also other conservators. The textile was part of a very important gift by J.P. Morgan in 1902 to the Cooper Hewitt Museum. And it came along with other pieces which were definitely colonial Peruvian textiles, such as this really beautiful um, uh, woman's mantle made entirely of silk and silver threads, uh, a, a great um, a statement about uh, the colonial world and the, the difference the changes that were taking place in that early period after the Spanish arrival. The, the Cooper Hewitt piece, um, the unknown piece was something very strange. And one of the issues was the, the yarns were so fine and these areas with the gray and the red and the yellow areas were definitely made of an animal hair. But if they were Peruvian, that animal should have been uh, a camelid. It should have been the vicuña or vic, um, or guanaco, something so fine. So in looking under the microscope, we found that, that these hairs that were forming uh, the tapestry weave uh, were not uh, the alpaca or, or the camelids. They, were, they had another quality. They had these little kind of black dots that formed the, its fibers. And it was something that we could see was not in the camelid family. Um, we know that, um, there, there are these small animals called biscacha um, in, the, um, in the Peruvian highlands that I had found uh, depicted in tapestries um, in a very enigmatic blue color often. And they were in many different of the tapestries from the 16th and 17th centuries. These little animals, uh, creatures which showed up. And in fact, they, they do represent the biscacha which has a hair that if the Cooper Hewitt piece was Peruvian, then that, that fine hair should have been uh, the biscacha. But in fact, it turned out to be rabbit hair and not biscacha. And so that kind of threw the, the idea of, um, of the Mexican or uh, the Peruvian origin uh, a little bit to the side. Then when we looked at the white areas, which were these incredibly uh, three-dimensional, uh, unusual places, um, we saw that looking under the microscope, we could see that actually they were made of feathers and it was some kind of spinning of feathers that were um, 
forming the yarns that were in these white areas. It was incredibly unusual. Um, for those of you who know about Peruvian feather work, the Peruvian feather workers always constructed um, the feathered pieces by tying a cord around every single feather and then taking that cord and stitching it onto a ground cloth. So we knew that it wasn't, um, it wasn't in the tradition of the Peruvian feather work. Um, we do know that in Mexico, there were a number of, um, uh, there's a number of evidence from different areas, both archeological and from colonial documents about the spinning of feathers in Mexico. And we have from the archeology, span these uh, spindle whorls, which have uh, depictions of feathers and birds on them. And it is interpreted that they, um, that they were um, uh, representing uh, the material that they were being used to spin. And we have from Bernardino Sahagun from the Florentine Codex, uh, this wonderful description of the feather sellers who pluck feathers and spin feathers. She uses the spindle, turns them loosely about the spindle. So we know that this tradition of spinning feathers uh, came from that early period, both of using um, uh, very soft um, uh, downy feathers, as well as rabbit hair. Um, there was a letter uh, from Hernán Cortés in his letter to the Queen of Spain in 1519, where he describes a large quantity of textiles and garments made of feathers and rabbit fur that were given to him. So with all of this, um, I was very confident to say that this piece was not Peruvian, but rather Mexican. And I think that it, it represents one of the earliest examples of this, what at least was an Aztec tradition, if not earlier um, in, in Mexico. It's very unique. And um, I know that I'm very happy to be talking about it in context of um, uh, uh, as, a, as a sort of introduction to Hector's work, who has worked a lot with um, feathers, uh, spinning feathers and, and the use of feathers in Mexican traditions. And so uh, I will turn the dialogue um, over to Hector. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction, Elena. I'm very, very happy to be here because just as you, this is one of my favorite subjects with pillows and feathers. I love this and that um, object that you showed us will definitely lead into some more conversation. Um, so in, I was very happy to be uh, invited to this session and in getting ready for the preparation, I decided to Google Whippiles de Pluma, feather whippiles, and see what came up, just for fun. And we find two main uh, pictures. The ones in purple, uh, we see a whippil uh, with something going on there that is not exactly yarn, and we may guess it's feathers. And the ones in pink, a different style, but an object, one same object repeated four times. And it's difficult to to understand at first, why does it come up where the feathers are? So first of all, I would like to briefly remind everyone what a wipil is. A wipil is a garment used in the Mesoamerican area for at least, that has been used in the region for at least two millennia. And this is the general form um, uh, that they look like. It's a rectangular um, garment. This would be folded uh, over the shoulder line. Um, the panels are sewn together lengthwise. And once it's folded, um, it's sewn on the borders. And of course, a neck opening uh, is worked in the center. We don't, uh, sorry. We don't know for sure what Wipiles in the pre-Columbian times look like. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Wipiles from that area. But we do have a lot of evidence in mural paintings, ceramics, um, um, depictions in, in, in uh, sculptures, etc. And we also know, because of other archaeological findings, that the more common uh, fibers that have been documented so far, as Laura Fijoy has published in a wonderful article 
are ad agaves, yucas, and cotton fiber. So we may assume that the huipiles in that period were also woven with these fibers. And uh, just as Elena said, we need to remember that in the Mesoamerican area, there were no proteic fibers other than the rabbit hair and feathers. There were no ships, there were no camelids, and they would be using uh, the rabbit hair and feathers into their works. Elena has already shown this image, and I really like to start with this one for um, the wipiles and feathers, because we see clearly two women wearing wipiles with feathers on top. We know they are feathers, uh, but we don't know how those feathers are attached to the fabric or interwoven into the fabric. However, when we start reading the descriptions of the same period in the 16th century uh, from the Mexica uh, culture, we see we find some hints here and there. Besides what Elena has already told us about the, the feather sellers, we also find these mentions, and excuse my translation, uh, but this uh, let us know that uh, for certain deities, the wipiles that they were um, um, covered with were covered with rich feathers. And they also let us know where those feathers were located. The border of the wipil was embroidered with feathers in various ways. They also let us know these descriptions from the Florentine Codex that certain women were expected or desired to, uh, to be good weavers and dyers of the rabbit hair and the feathers. So with this uh, mention, we also get to know that the feathers were not only being used in their natural colors, but also uh, were being dyed. Throughout the 16th and the 18th centuries, we find different uh, mentions of the wipiles and feathers here and there, uh, such as Morelos, the state of Mexico, Puebla, Oaxaca. And they let us know that the wipiles were used with uh, multicolored feathers, or that the borders were uh, had woven feather work, or that the wipiles had two square fields, one in the chest, one in the back, work with, he with fe uh, feathers, or that even there was a specific dog in the northern mountains of Oaxaca uh, with a red beak that was grown to use its feathers uh, for these textiles. So these, all these narrations and all these chronicles let us imagine to a certain extent what these wipilis could have looked like. But of course, images speak volumes. And we have this lienzo de Tlaxcala from the 16th century. And in the center, we find Malintzin, a key um, character in the history of this um, territory. And we see this very long, uh, wide wipil. And uh, you might tell me, where do you see feathers there? And I'm going, I'm getting there, just be a little bit tension with me. We see this um, Malintzin again portrayed here at the Manuscrito de Texas with other women. And um, all of them have this same style of repeal with the ornamented borders and the uh, field on the chest, probably in the back as well. As, uh, and we see that the ground fabrics are also lowered. They are all checkered. And, and this one with these bands in the warp, uh, multicolored bands. Um, so as we move uh, uh, throughout the 16th century and look at other documents, we also see, start to understand better the construction of these wipilis. In these two images, we see, we understand now that the wipil is made out of three different panels. The one in the middle is the one with the bands in the warp. And the two of them have this ornamented border here and this field on the chest. And actually both of them have this a small uh, drawing that is kind of a feather. And they may be suggesting us that um, these elements were woven with feathers. <clears throat> we get to the 17th century and there are a number of screens in different museums. This one uh, is uh, today at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It's from the late part of the 17th century. And when we look closely at it, we still find those wipiles 
uh, being worn, not in the texture, but we do find them in the dimensions and the style. They are very wide, very long, and the ornamented borders and the um, fields. And here we see them on the back, but we also see them on the front. And this is actually a bride in that same screen. And when we look closely at the motif that is woven here, we see a double-headed creature. You might also say that's a stretch, but I will show you why I think <clears throat> it's a double-headed creature. During the 17th century as well, uh, we find this painting that is actually portraying a scene from the 16th century, the baptism of the rulers of Tlaxcala. <clears throat> and uh, this woman here is supposed to be Malintzin. That image is actually uh, derived from the lienzo de Tlaxcala that I showed earlier. It's this one here. And you see the posture of the body and the dimensions of the wood wheel are very similar. However, how, does, how did the painter go from this to this? This wood wheel resembles clearly to these ones here that I showed you from the screen at LAGMA. And um, you might also say, well, why, why choose this kind of wood What was he looking at? Because when we look at this painting, I know we need to take paintings with a grain of salt because not always they portray reality as it is, but it's an interpretation. However, the painting actually shows different surfaces, different textures, different weavings, different materials being used in the textiles. And he or she really wanted us to know that this texture was different. This white texture was different than the checkered fabric, for example. So what made him or her paint this? I think he was looking at these objects. The one to the left is a Huipil a house at the Museo Nacional de Antropología in Mexico City. And it's, it is the only full Huipil that exists to our knowledge with this technique and these characteristics. You see the dimensions, it's very, very large. And um, you see this element here, it's a two-headed eagle. And that's what made me think that the other image that I showed you, it's also a double-headed creature. This fragment uh, is a part of the Museo Textil de Oaxaca's collection. And it uh, arrived to us thanks to the generosity of Francisco Toledo. And um, this fragment actually was part of a mid-bottom um, central panel we built like this one. The materials are the same, the, the technical sequence is the same, um, and also the dating analysis throughout the same results. When we look at it closely, all these texture elements are feather yarns, and the feather, uh, the pink, purple, yellow, green, blue, it's all dyed. So in order to do this, then they would use down feathers. They are very flexible. They are easy to be spun and plied. This rigid structure of larger feathers doesn't make that possible. And so far, the analysis have showed us three, these three birds as suppliers of the down. These two ducks, one goose. And in this one in particular, we remind we remember the mentions of the 18th century chronicles from Oaxaca, where they describe this red beaked dock as a source of feathers for textiles. When we look at the yarn closer, uh, we understand the structure. We see two cotton plies um, where the down is trapped in between, and the down is dyed before this process takes place. This is different to the uh, Cooper Hill textile that Elena showed, although that textile, that technique must have been used in these examples as well, probably. These are the dyes that we, we have found so far in these two uh, repeals, uh, well, the repeal and the fragment. And um, we have yet to see what the yellow dye was. And then, we have a 
to walk over a bridge until the 20th century. We don't know, really know for sure what happened in between, but um, in the 20th century, we find this Sinacantan with pillars from the Soxili people in Chiapas, today Chiapas. We already noticed many differences, but there are formal characteristics that are still there. The opening of the neck, like a vertical slit, the decoration on the chest, uh, on the bottom, this one also has a decoration. Some of them have the decoration at the back as well. And Ingar Johnson, um, great, great, great uh, pioneer in the study of Mexican textiles, described this technique in her paper in the 50s uh, with the two ply yarn. You see it here, although it's very different, and they are also not using down only, they are using big feathers as well. But the feathers are not only being incorporated with, uh, during the weaving process, they are also being sewn onto the fabric. And if we move further ahead in the 20th century, we see other differences like this we build here. Uh, the neck is different, uh, but the location of the feather work is, keeps the same pattern. And when we look at the feathers closer, we actually notice that there is no more down here. It's actually big, large feathers. And they use this rigid structure to insert the feather into the weaving process as if, it, as if the feather uh, was a, a weft. So when we studied that textile fragment back in 20, 2006, uh, we thought it, it was necessary to uh, socialize the results of this research project with weavers, dyers, spinners, even embroiderers from different places of Mexico. And it is because of that um, initiative and that communication that we were able to put together an exhibition in 2016 with contemporary feather work. Maria Santiago was one of the artists that participated in this exhibition. She is a weaver from Sinacantan, Chiapas, and um, she, knew, she learned to weave this sort of wipiles with a feather yarn, but she told us that it had been 40 years since she made the last one in this style, and she never imagined someone else would come to her and ask for a wipil that looked like that. She uh, departed from a wipil in this style from the collections of the Centro de Textiles del Mundo Maya uh, in San Cristóbal de las Casas. This is a true team effort because the feathers are um, made by, the feather yarn uh, is made by Roman Gutierrez in Oaxaca, in Toticlan del Valle. Then the wool yarn that you see here is dyed with natural dyes in San Juan Chamula. And then Maria wove it in Sinacantan. Alejandro de Avila and Noel Pinzón, colleagues of us at the Textile Museum, are, have also been experimenting with the feather yarns and the wood pillars. And this is the first wood pill they wove back in 2018. And in the next few weeks, we hope to be unveiling the new wood pill they, they wove that they just finished this year. It's, it's extraordinary. If you would like to know more about the processes of the feather yarn making, uh, we put together our website uh, during the 2016 exhibition. The information is all in Spanish, but the pictures and videos speak volumes and you, will, you get to see how the down is dyed, how it, how it is spun or plied. And it's a very, very good uh, way to know more about this. I would just like to finish this um, very quick review of the feather with Billis uh, with this image, just to say that sometimes people think that these uh, uh, textile expressions are static and, and thus cannot be considered art. I do think they are art and they are not static at all. Women have been enduring many, many different things uh, throughout time, indigenous uh, peoples, throughout time. And it is through textiles that they have persisted in preserving their knowledge and in creating all these wonderful uh, textiles that continue to be here. Maybe the yarns are not the same, maybe the colors are not the same, but what is important is that the knowledge is still there and it is because of them that, is, that it exists. So we must recognize their talent, their creativity and their courage 
in resisting um, with these traditions and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. That was wonderful. Um, um, it's so overwhelming because the pieces are so beautiful. You know, there's such a beauty to uh, ethereal beauty to seeing the feathers as they kind of float on the surface of those textiles and that you you showed so beautifully in the in the LACMA painting where it's it's so definitely being rendered as a, that three-dimensionality I I, um, I wonder if um, have, have you ever have you looked at any you know so it, it seems like we can bring this subject to definitely to the 16th century have you do you have any hints of, of how early it may have started or this use of feathers you know we, we see so many uh, references in uh, maya pieces about these translucent garments and you know there's a, a definitely a, a a trying to create this these qualities of cloth but this this quality of cloth is something so special, it, it really has such a composite character to it. Yes, I, I, I don't know for sure. And that is one of the challenges and mysteries that still, that are still there. However, again, Laura Fijoy and, and, and another colleague of hers, that I can't remember her name right now, uh, they studied a textile, it's, it's actually a funerary um, bundle, and the fabric that covers this mummified uh, child is um, it's, it's using a, a, a feather yarn. It's different to these ones, though, because in that case, it's a Nixle, I think it's a Nixle, uh, based um, yarn, and then a rigid, uh, a large feather, it's... Um, this, the, the name in Spanish is entorchado, but in English, it's when you go around a core yarn, um, like metallic threads. Like uh, wrapping, uh, wrapping. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you. The, the, the feathers are wrapping those Ixle fibers. Mm -hmm. and, and that is very early on. Um, I can look into my uh, <laughs> shit, shit. <laughs> but... Um, um, uh, that is much, much earlier than the textile that you saw that you procured and evidently okay. the, the ones that we deal with. So we have those evidences of feathers and, and we must also remember that feathers are, um, have always been very important in, in those uh, mm -hmm. cultures. So they were always associated with um, the, the religious world and the underworld and the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I guess they must have been around very early on. And um, we see more of them with the descriptions made in the 16th century, mm -hmm. because where people were trying to figure out what they were looking at. Mm -hmm. But um, I think they were there much, much, much earlier. Yeah, um, you know, as you as you're saying that, I I think that, you know, if we look at the snapshot of the 16th century and the way the feather, um, in a very different um, different process, the making of the feather paintings, the so-called feather mosaics, uh, which adheres feathers onto uh, a surface that, um, you know, to make mostly religious images and um, that were the sort of um, treasures of the Mexican art form that was sent to Europe as a sort of um, uh, symbol of the, of the advanced culture that, that the Spanish had encountered. Um, but, and then we have all these uh, um, Quetzal feather um, uh, headdresses, whether they're real or not. I know there's some <laughs> debate um, and, and all the tribute lists that we know about the feathers and you know feathers coming from different regions. Uh, these materials are so, are so interesting. And as well as the rabbit hair, I, I don't know if there are any um, 
of the textiles that were sent again to Spain um, in the 16th century made of rabbit hair, that it would be, it, it's not something you can generally just tell by looking at it. So, so it, it, it requires that, that macro investigation to be able to identify them. But um, I don't yes. know, are there other, are there uses of the rabbit hair in, um, in repeals without the feathers? Or are they sort of always, do we associate them together now? Huh? They probably were. There is a fragment from um, Guerrero in Chiapa uh -huh. that is woven with rabbit hair. And uh -huh. I think it's a gauze weave. And it's actually using um, pigment, not a dye, uh, to give it a red color. But it's, it's only a fragment. So we don't know what the complete uh, object was. And probably it, there might have been feathers, there might have not been feathers, mm -hmm. but the rabbit hair is there. Yeah. Um, I think the rabbit hair actually got lost before the feather yarns got lost. Mm -hmm. um, the, the object that you studied, uh, that you got lost and Lucy studied at the Cooper Hewitt is the only reference I have from that mm -hmm. period with rabbit hair. Yeah. Um, and I guess that because wool was so quickly adopted mm -hmm. that it substituted it yeah. to an extent. Um, also, the, this combination of feathers and, and rabbit hair was also linked to the religious motif. So it's, it was not only garments that were being made, it was actually also religious objects and altar clothes, mm -hmm. and etc. I think it, it's also one of the relations the, the letters of Cortes to, to Spain that mentions those uh, religious items being made out of these two particular materials uh, mm -hmm. and sent over to Spain. Yeah. So I think, um, and again, these, these, these materials that appear and the creativity and adaptability of weavers to incorporate them into their own uh, core and make them their own is what uh, led to these changes. Uh, for example, rabbit hair, you have wool, it dyes as well. It's easier to, to handle because the, 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 the fiber is much longer, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yeah. and, and then with the feathers, when I was talking about this uh, to a friend, she was telling me, well, you know, what if during the, because we, we start losing track of this feather with the in the 18th century. Um, and the, the latest that we have found are seven references, pictorial references are 1710, something like that. Mm. Um, and, and you have all this corpus of cased paintings. Mm. And in those paintings, you start looking at uh, lace and all these very thin and ethereal fabrics mm. that are also uh, recreating the translucency that you were mentioning before but also the status because all those materials were being imported. So feathers were hard to acquire. They require a lot of work and, um, and they showed your position to an extent in society. And lace was doing that as well in the 18th century. So was it that we can tell, but it's one of the hypotheses or the possibilities that, that may have arisen in that period and that led to the um, fall of the feather yarns. And it's also interesting to see how these traditions were moving because most of the times we see these mentions of the huipiles and feathers in the central area of Mexico, um, Oaxaca of all yeah. also, but not so much in Chiapas yeah. where they are being yeah. made today. So, um, so I, I just I wanted to ask you about that. Can you talk a little bit more about the woman that was that made them, you know, thirty years before, and 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 had she been making them longer than that, or was it a special? I, I don't know. How did that come about? Did she? Were you able to talk with her yes. about that? Yeah, we um, we approached the Centro de Textiles um, in San Cristobal when we were working on this project because of, co of course they are closer to the area and they have a, a wider network over there than we do. And they connected us with Maria Santiago. <clears throat> she is one of the weavers that uh, continues with this tradition. Um, there are not many weavers, but there are some. 
And they actually, a few years ago, they hosted at, in San Cristobal, they hosted a meeting of weavers of this particular wood bill to discuss the process and the meaning of the wood bill. And, and Maria, she learned the technique when she was 18 years old by her godmother. And she remembered that the first wood billers were that style with the feather yarn. Um, but as, as we see in the example that is at the Fowler and the other, the last one that I showed, okay. the technique change uh, throughout time, making those yarns is very, very yeah. difficult. It takes yeah. a lot yeah. of time. Yeah. And, um, and then it changed and she continued to whip those kind of whip <clears throat> And that's why she said, I, that is a, a style, in other words, that is a style that I never thought I would do again after yeah. four yeah. years because yeah. it's, it, it's no longer <clears throat> being commissioned that much even by um, women from Sinacantan, mm -hmm. it's, it's usually worn for weddings mm -hmm. um, and it's become so expensive and so difficult to, to have one that some women are using other kind of dress for their wedding or um, renting or asking, borrowing these um, with pillars that are still, mm -hmm. still existing within the community for their wedding and then they give it back. Mm -hmm. um, because it's it's become very very rare and very difficult to get one. But who who taught her to weave with it? Oh, uh, she only told us it was her grandmother mm -hmm. who, who was a weaver of this tradition, and she oh, taught okay. her to weave them. Oh, wow, wonderful! That's wonderful. That's really great. I I feel like there are probably lots of questions from the audience, and perhaps we should switch to see what um, questions are around. Sure. <laughs> yes. We've got lots of great questions and I would encourage people to continue to upvote questions that you would most like to hear answered. Right now, the front runner is a question from Sandra Castro Baker. So we'll start with this one. And Sandra is curious to know, um, and this is a question for Hector. Do you know the significance of the double-headed eagle? There are many different interpretations of that. <clears throat> the one that immediately comes to mind is, is the shield of the Habsburg family, the, the Spanish royalty, um, Austrian Spanish royalty. Uh, however, there are many other myths and legends in Mesoamerican cultures that speak of a double-headed creature. It's not always mm -hmm. an eagle, but it might be a bird or some other creature. Um, and it's closely linked to the creation of the sun and the moon and twins in different um, variations of the story uh, among different peoples. And uh, it's a battle of these twins towards against the monster and eventually taking it down um, because it was a very dangerous creature and it would um, kidnap kids and things like that. And um, I, I don't tell only one because there are many, many different variations, um, but we believe that all those myths um, certainly found an echo in the Habsburg shield. And it was a way of continuing weaving the motif while, while not presenting a threat uh, because mm -hmm. of, of, of their weaving. No, it was a secret um, meaning to them. It, it was not the evident or the surface only that was uh, being read by those who knew all these other stories. So um, um, yeah, that's what I can say about that. I don't know if you know a little bit more about that, Elena. I mean, of course, we always, the first thing when you look at something made after the Spanish arrival, we think of the double-headed eagle as such a symbol, but um, it, I, I, I don't know in the Mesoamerican area, the origins of the, that so it sounds it sounds very plausible that it can have a lot of different um, mm -hmm. meanings and, and the fact that it's kind of at the heart you know it's placed at the heart um, you don't find that in just anywhere on the garment it's mm -hmm. a specific um, location so that would to me also indicate that it, it has um, deep significance to, to wear it at your heart like that. thank you Okay, so Nancy has a question and she's wondering if the designs of the squares on the front and back 
and or the borders have any special meaning, like belonging to a certain class or group or culture or religious or spiritual meaning? Well, it's it's a little bit hard to say. I can only um, I could only make reference to a con to a contemporary use in Oaxaca in one place called San Felipe Lucila. Alejandro de Avila has um, uh, been in touch with um, Irma Garcia Isidro. She is a weaver from the area. She is originally from there, and she documented with uh, many um, elder women from her community about the square on the chest. It has the, sh the motif of a diamond and it's linked with the passes of life, the, the very uh, landmark of, of a life cycle, like um, mar marriage or coming of age or death. Mm -hmm. it, but some of those motifs are linked to that life cycle. And the main, uh, the main diamond is actually linked to the moment when the person dies and that is um, a doorway to the other world. So that is a very, very special um, motif and location of the motif within the Whitbill, the Whitbill's construction. But it's, it's very difficult. I don't think we could generalize about the meaning of, of elements and, and compositions because every different people has its own aesthetic and background history and beliefs. But that is one that may or may not have been linked to those squares that we looked at. Thank you. All right, so um, George is wondering if there's any part of the research that covers the sustainability of harvesting the feathers and whether modern efforts are taking steps to be sustainable. And similarly, Fiona wonders if we know what birds gave their feathers to these garments. Yeah, so we know a few of the birds that were used um, in the index in the tests that we carried out with the fragment at the Oaxaca Museum. We knew there were two kind of ducks: the uh, Muscovy duck and the uh, Mexican duck, uh, called Mexican duck. And um, but there were also six, four other down feathers that could not be identified. Mm. So it was a mix of feathers of birds. And um, if we go back in time to the 16th century, we have all these chronicles and mentions of the Spanish that say that Moctezuma, the ruler of the Mexica people, had this amazing garden for birds. And um, he had uh, hundreds of people whose sole job was taking care of the birds and picking up the feathers that they would be shedding. So we have in that a sustainability in a way, because I mean, people were being kind of uh, forced to do that, but birds were not being harmed. And when we had, uh, we have images of, of uh, the hunting of certain birds in the lake where people would uh, swim uh, with, um, cover, with their heads covered so that the ducks wouldn't notice them as they were getting closer. And then they would trap them they would uh, pluck some feathers and release them again. So we have all those mentions mm -hmm. uh, in that time period. What we did for the, in, since what we've been doing since 2007, we have tried many different ways of doing that. At first we were purchasing pillows and <laughs> getting, getting feathers as much as, and as any time we could. It was not very, uh, successful, <laughs> and then, uh, but it's still uh, some people managed to do amazing work with those feathers. And then uh, a few years ago, we contacted a company based in the U.S. who work with people over in Europe. And because of all the consumption of, of goose in, uh, in Europe, they are obtaining those feathers that way. And um, they have assured me that they have these, um, all these sustainability seals in place. So as mm. to make sure that it's a fair uh, treat to those geese. And that's how we've been using these, um, these materials. It is becoming increasingly harder though, because it's very expensive uh, to bring mm. those to, to Mexico. And also because of other administrative regulations that we have in our country that make these imports very difficult. 
Thank you. And I'll just say that the uh, for the Cooper Hewitt piece, it was the feathers were identified by the Smithsonian um, um, bird specialist as coming from goose. Oh. Goose down, right. of course, yeah. So Annabelle is wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the dyeing processes of the feathers. Um, are they more delicate than other weaving materials and require a different process per chance? Yes, th that has also been quite a challenge. And I think it's been Roman Gutierrez, a master dyer and weaver from the Pitlan del Valle, who has really refined the process today. <clears throat> When we first started looking at that process in 2006 and seven, it was very difficult to actually get the same saturation of color as mm. we see in the old examples. Uh, mm. Feathers have a much um, a thicker and coarser um, layer of fats that is difficult mm. to get through to the dye, for the dye to, to give color to the material. And it was Roman who has been working for over 10 years now in uh, perfectioning this process. He has these different steps to eliminate that fat without it being too much, because if you remove too much of the fat, the feathers become very brittle and, and it's impossible to do anything with them. He has also uh, worked out the different concentrations of, dye, of dyes to achieve those uh, bright colors. Today, the palette that he has is larger than the palette that we find in the 16th century examples and the 18th century examples, sorry, 17th. And, um, and yes, we can, um, it is for sure that it takes much more dye to dye uh, feathers mm -hmm. than silk or wool. But one, the, the, one of the big processes is the, cl the cleaning part, the cleaning stage. And the other, the drying stage, because uh, one, during our first attempts, they would stuck together as when you wet feathers and it, they lose their uh, texture, they lose their volume. And uh, we still don't know how this drying process was carried out uh, earlier. But today what Roman does is very clever because he uses a uh, cotton muslin bag he puts in the, the wet uh, feathers after the dyeing process and inserts a hair drying machine and uses the air to recover the, the texture and the volume. And he's, he's great. I mean, he's wonderful in doing this. I, can I ask, has, has he done any spinning of rabbit hair? We haven't found the rabbit hair yet. We tried and for the 2016 exhibition. Mm -hmm. And you remember that I showed you his interpretation of the, of the piece that you studied. <laughs> and in order to weave that, we tried to combine, to stick as much as possible to the materials, but it was impossible to get the, the rabbit hair. So no, not yet, but I'm sure he is really interested and he is still with his yeah. finger on the spot to try and do it sometime. I mean, you know, it, it's like we, we look at these materials and it, just discovering them is, is one level, but then thinking about how these ancient people, you know, the, mm -hmm. the knowledge and the skill that was involved in preparing these things to such a high level, it, oh, yes. it's Absolutely. really just astonishing, so. Yeah. yeah. All right, so now we have um, a question about, um, you know, the wardrobe that one might wear in addition to a huipil. Um, Nancy's saying, you know, in some of these images, it looks like um, the women are wearing a skirt or pants, um, or sometimes it looks like the huipil is reaching their ankles. Sometimes it looks like there's something else under the huipil. Um, so what would one wear in addition to a huipil? So the basic wardrobe would be, in, in central Mexico, would mm -hmm. be uh, the huipil, and then a wraparound skirt, um, and then a sash uh, holding the wraparound skirt in place. The whip mm -hmm. might be shorter, longer, narrower, uh, different variations. And sometimes the whip was not used. For example, in different places of Oaxaca, the whip was not used, only the wraparound skirt and the, and the sash. Um, and in other places, 
uh, in, instead of a, a, a wood bill, they would be using a Ketchke metal, which was another of the topics of this morning's class with Elena, <laughs> another very characteristic uh, item. And, and that is, we bill is located today in Guatemala and similar garments mm. with the exact same shape are located in other places of the world, but the Ketchke metal is unique to the Mesoamerican area. And that is um, what they would, those are the basic components of what women would wear in pre-colonial times. Thank you. All right, so Maya's asking if there's a word for the square panel at the Hupile's neck. Was that separately woven or integral to the larger central panel? And um, someone from the um, Textile Museum Associates of, oh darn, I can't see of where. But um, the one, they thought that maybe the square was sewn on separately and it was a reinforcement piece to prevent the neck from splitting over time. Um, and then they started decorating it. Can you, what, what's, the, what's the answer here? It's, it's woven as the central panel was woven. And this is an example of that. It's all woven on one, one same panel. And then the neck opening is actually uh, splitting the weft into two, so that mm. in order to create the opening, uh, and, and that's how it was made. In, in other uh, examples, this line over here is actually making the function of that reinforcement that uh, you mentioned uh, to prevent the, the fabric from um, splitting when you are trying it on. But in this case, it's, all, it's always uh, woven at the same time as the rest of the panel. Thank you. Okay, that's all we have time for today. We have still 28 open questions. So I'll be sure to send you guys the Q&A report so you guys can see all these questions that were entered here. And, um, you know, thank you so much for spending this last hour with us. Thank you, Elena, for inviting Hector. And Hector, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we always appreciate it when we have Elena's guests here. Thank you to the audience who came, we had about 300 people here today. And um, this program has been recorded. It will be available immediately on the Fowler's Facebook. So if you wanna see it um, immediately, you can go to facebook.com slash Fowler Museum, um, slash Fowler Museum, not the Fowler Museum. Um, or you can wait a couple days and we will email the link to the program recording directly to everyone who RSVP'd. And it will also be available on our Instagram for you to revisit and share. And we hope that uh, you will join us for our next program. You can find details on the closing slide. In the meantime, oh, have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.